Welcome everybody, this is the London Futurist Hangout on what lies in the future for cryonics. People have the opportunity to raise questions as we go on, on Google+, and in a moment we'll hear from our panel, all of whom have got good knowledge of cryonics. First, a few words about how I find that people generally view cryonics. Chronics is an interesting subject, but if you ask most people, they say it's relatively fringe. The number of people who are signed up for cryonics around the world is still at most in the thousands. It's very much a minority viewpoint, and the general perception seems to be that people who are signed up for cryonics are potentially eccentric, that the viewpoint of cryonics are scientifically implausible, it's just wishful thinking that people who are engaged in chronics, and again this is the general viewpoint which I often encounter, such people must be foolish or even deluded. Now I think all of these viewpoints are unfair and I believe that in the next 10, 15 years there will be things happening that will change many of these perceptions and that's what we'll be exploring in this session. We'll be looking at why things may happen to change chronics from being a fringe activity to being much more of a mainstream activity. Instead of being viewed as an eccentric hobby, it will be viewed as something with a lot of scientific and engineering background. Instead of being viewed as highly implausible, it will be seen as increasingly a plausible approach to ensuring continuity of consciousness over a long period of time. Instead of being foolish, it will actually be sensible. And the initial pioneers of chronics, rather than being viewed as deluded, will in many cases be seen as visionary. Ray. And that brings us back to the panelists today. And if I stop sharing my screen, hopefully you can now see the panelists ready to speak. And what I'm going to do to start off this discussion before we turn it to audience questions, is I'm going to ask each of the panelists in turn to talk, to start off with not so much about the future yet, but about some of their own past involvement in cryonics. How do they come to be involved and what are they currently doing? So for a few minutes each, please, and I'll start with uh, Max Moore, who is the CEO of Alcor, which in many ways is the world's leading cryonics company with a track record of 41 years. Max. Thank you, David. Yes, 41 years. Um, as many years as some of us. Um, Garrett and I have a lot of history in cryonics. We started the first uh, real European organization back in 1986. Uh, we both came over to the States for six weeks and got trained over here and went back and uh, probably scared our, our neighbors and roommates with a box of drugs and heart-lung resuscitator machines that we kept with us. And uh, that really got cryonics started here and we both signed up that year while we were in California. So that was uh, 1986, a long, long time ago. I was 22 years old at the time. And since that time, there's been a lot of changes in cryonics. Uh, but right from the beginning, the logic was compelling to me. I remember he, I first really got to know about cryonics as a real thing from meetings at Imperial College that we used to go to, Garrett and a few other people. And at the time that I first hooked up with them, I think about 1983 or four, uh, they were really talking a lot about cryonics and getting the magazine that Alcor still produces. And uh, it seemed... You know, life extension was the thing for us. We didn't want to die in the first place. We didn't want our bodies to stop functioning. But if that happened, then cryonics seemed like the obvious extension of life extension. Uh, if your body isn't going to make it, if life extension science doesn't move fast enough, or if you have something that goes seriously wrong, then it's obvious backup policy. It's the real life insurance policy. So I didn't have to be sold on the idea at all. It just seemed bloody obvious to me. I thought, why would everybody not do this? Which is yeah. why it's always baffling. One of the things we can discuss, why aren't millions of people signed up for cryonics? Uh, so I moved over the next year, um, jumped ship from England, came over to the States and was involved in a number of cryopreservation cases in the first few years. And then three years ago, um, I took over running Alcor. Basically, I'm approaching my half-century mark and life extension hasn't moved fast enough. I'm not seeing enough progress, so I'm getting kind of worried. So Cryonics is becoming increasingly important to me. Uh, so I agreed to take on this job. Is that the kind of intro you, you wanted? That's very good, and you've laid up uh, lots of points for further discussion, uh, Max. Let's go to Anders Sandberg next, and Anders has also been uh, tracking uh, chronic activities for a number of years. So, Anders, maybe you can tell us about your involvement and how you got involved. Yeah. <clears throat> so, my first uh, encounter with cryonics must have been in some science fiction stories I read as a young uh, boy. And as I grew up and started trying to make that science fiction real, 
uh, I felt Cryonic was, of course, obviously sensible. But living in Sweden and having a student's uh, economic means, it was kind of outside my normal realm. That didn't stop me, of course, from writing and thinking about it. So actually, my first uh, major media appearance on a Swedish television show was partially framed because of cryonics. Marta Sandberg, a fellow Swede, unfortunately not related to me, uh, was on this show and uh, was talking about her cryonic suspension. And I've been kind of called in as a, techno a technological expert to explain some of the stuff. So that was interesting because it also told me far more than I wished I knew about how to make media. I kind of saw how the sausages of public opinion were made. And uh, that got me more and more involved in actually actively promoting ideas of cryonics. Finally, of course, I ended up in Oxford and found that, oh, I'm actually living in a country where it would make sense to be signed up. The interesting part was that I was discussing this with uh, academic colleagues, and we more or less agreed that this was a rational, good thing to do. And uh, then we realized we had the same discussion one year earlier, and perhaps a similar one one year earlier than that. Hmm, we think this is rational, but we're still not doing it. That's an itch you cannot scratch if you're in the philosophy department. That's downright embarrassing, not doing what you think is right. So we managed to uh, convince ourselves that, yeah, let's do a race for it. The last uh, to sign up, he buys the dinner. So that's how I ended up uh, getting my uh, contract. And you're showing your cryonics uh, medallion as we speak. Maybe you just mentioned what, what, what does it say on that medallion? So the instructions to uh, doctors, uh, either in, uh, you have it around your wrist or as I do uh, in a little medallion. I sometimes call it my secular St. Christopher's medallion, uh, uh, trying to you know, get around uh, the dangers of travel in, uh, through life. So this is instructions to doctors that if I kill over dead, what to do with me. And the most important one is, of course, uh, to call Alcor. And then there are various instructions about cooling me with ice, injecting heparin. And at this point, when I'm talking to uh, medical professionals, when they start reading these medallions, they typically do um, as a matter of professional habit, the eyebrows start going up. 50,000 units of heparin? That's a lot. And uh, at this point, of course, I either have a great conversation starter, or they have just decided that, yeah, that guy is crazy. Well, there's a lot of more we can discuss there, too. But let's uh, continue with the round of introductions on the panel. I'd like to come now to Natasha Vitamore. Uh, Natasha, you have a long history in uh, transhumanism generally and bodily enhancement. Uh, what's uh, your historical involvement with cryonics? My historical gotcha. involvement started in, I think it was 1985, when I went to um, the Alcor facility when it was in California. And I went to a conference somewhere around that time, maybe it was 1986, and it just made sense to me immediately. I signed up in 1991, and I've been a, a happy member ever since. Happy that Cryonics is becoming even more scientifically and technologically uh, correct if we want to look at the advances that have been going on and where it lies within the parameters of advances in science and technology as well as social change. The economics of life extension is always an issue. However, the uh, cost of medical upkeep has far exceeded the cost of cryonics, which is really reasonable if you think about it. Um, I I've only been a member of Alcor, and I, I think it is the most substantial chronics organization to date from my research and understanding. Um, the idea of chronics for me and why I signed up and why I continue to support it is because it is the best safety net we have today. And even if you stay as healthy as possible and follow all the protocols and methods for living a healthy life, anything could happen at any time. And because of this, we need a safety net, just like we need a 401k um, account or an IRA or even just a basic savings account. We need to protect our lives as feasibly as possible, and chronics is the best safety net we have today. Okay, we may come back to that. People may think that there are better safety nets instead. I want to 
at this moment thank uh, Alexander Karan for being the first person to raise a question on the Q&A page of a uh, Google Plus. We'll come to your question shortly, Alexander. I see it's already got three uh, votes in favor of it, and it is a good question. But before we look at that, or indeed any of the other questions that people can raise or vote, I'd like to turn to the fourth member of the panel, Garrett Smith. We already heard a bit about your background, Garrett, when Max was speaking, but uh, what have you been doing in the 26 or so years since you got interested in cryonics? Um, I, Garrett. Didn't, I didn't become... Uh, the, I haven't had led such an illustrious career as Max, being that he's now head of Alcor. But um, well, going. I mean, I, I wanted to pick up something that that others have already said, which was that the when I first heard about it, as I'd heard about it before, both in science fiction and uh, it was the science fiction author's daughter I heard about just on the grapevine, but not as a serious cryonics as a serious thing, until in the BBC, who I'll come back to later, did a television program about cryonics in 1980, and I just got it immediately and ran out to everybody I knew and just said, look, we don't have to die. Um, I mean, I, while I'd been at school, um, in biology lessons, it had occurred to me that um, it was very odd that, on the one hand, we, we were talking about culturing cells in the laboratory, and um, they usually... HALA, I think they refer, it's referred to the particular cell strain from a cancer that a woman had many, many years ago. And it occurred to me, wasn't it odd, that on the one hand you get cancer, they go, the cells become effectively immortal and kill you. Or alternatively, you don't get it, and you see your, slow, your cells slowly do the absolute opposite of becoming immortal, and they become decrepit and fall apart and die and kill you. And our lives are this fine tightrope between our cells going mad and killing us or our cells just giving up the ghost and killing us. <clears throat> and that was while I was at school. So when the program came on, I just knew, I thought this is just so sensible and they thought of problems I hadn't even begun to think of and they'd come up with solutions for them. And I just knew if I told everybody about it, everybody, this, there'd be this massive movement. I was expecting the next day, you know, a revolution to start. And everybody thought I was a bit odd. And very slowly, um, a friend of mine spotted a small ad in New Scientist, and it was an ad from someone saying, are you interested in cryonics? Get, get in touch. And you had a P.O. box number at the time that I wrote to it. And the person at that P.O. box put me in touch with other people, and um, eventually we had the meetings in Imperial College, and I met Max, and we joined up. And then, so the <coughs> rest of the question is, well, there's still some footage on some TV company archive somewhere, I imagine, of me a good 20 years ago, if not more, saying that I would, and I think it's significantly more than 20 years, I'm absolutely sure that in 20 years' time you'll get this. We won't be considered eccentric. And, you know, here we are having, <laughs> having the same wretched discussion way more than 20 years later, so my prediction was rather poor there, although things have moved on a lot. I mean, in those days you had, I mean, it was, Eric Drexler's book just came out in 1986, I think it was, and it was the sort of first public use of the term nanotechnology. nanotechnology. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we, anybody involved in cryonics knew there was going to be some kind of amazing thing that was going to fix any freezing damage or, or whatever it had killed you. But there wasn't the word for it, there wasn't the in-depth explanation that he came up with. Um, and then similarly at the time, I remember telling a school friend about when it had occurred to me that we either die from our cells going mad and multiplying too much or because they give up and there had to be some way of keeping them in control and then we would live very, very long lives and he just thought, and I, he was my the best shot at someone I would trust to unburden myself of this thought and he just laughed at me wildly um, and told me what he did so well. Um, and anyone I mentioned anything like that to, and we talked about longevity and life extension, until I started meeting the people at the, uh, in, in the common room at Imperial, um, everybody thought it was utterly lunatic. But now it's such a relief to see you know, people like Aubrey de Grey and the SENS meetings, and they are actually seriously regular talk in the media of things that extend lifespan. And it, I mean, that is such a bit, it's no longer having to persuade people to believe six impossible things before breakfast. 
so um, how would well be, would, is that enough? <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's a very good start, Mark uh, Garrett. Uh, it is interesting the fact that many technological changes take a long time to come into fruition. I remember 20 years ago, people were predicting every year that the next year would be the year of the LAN network, local area networks, and it took quite a few years before networks did become uh, common. Uh, about 10 years ago, or, uh, people were predicting soon that we'd, uh, next year would be the year of location, that phones would have built-in uh, GPS systems, and that took quite a while to take place as well. And it was the same with uh, tablets, tablet computers, which were shown for many years at computer events, and then finally they were dominant as a result of the breakthroughs which were made by the iPad. So. But my question I'm going to raise back to the whole panel now uh, is what do you think is going to be different in the next 10 years from, say, the last 20 years? What's going to mean that uh, there's going to be more attention paid to cryonics? Can you point to any changes in the science and engineering in the medical world? Or can you point to other changes which are going to make this more credible? And let's go around the panel in the same order as before, starting with uh, Max. What will make the big change in perception of cryonics is really hard to say. You know, some people have thought that getting a celebrity to endorse it would make a big difference, and I guess it might it might depend on who the celebrity is. But I think really more powerful is it's just a slow, gradual shift in perception from a number of different perspectives. One thing we've seen change in the last couple of decades, for instance, is when we deal with hospitals, hospital administrators, the risk people at the hospitals, uh, the doctors and nurses, 20 years ago, generally, with rare exceptions, they'd be pretty hostile or resistant to us doing anything in the hospital. And ideally, because we like to position our equipment right there next to the patient, um, so when legal death is declared, we can go into action. Uh, but they weren't very happy about that in the past. Now, m almost always, they're pretty cooperative and even eager to help. They kind of want to hang around and see what's going on, offer to help as much as they can. That's a real change, and I think that's partly because they're seeing the science advance, they understand a bit more that there are now several dozen kinds of tissues that are being cryopreserved and rewarmed. Um, and in principle, actually, there are people walking around who were cryopreserved, except at the time they were just uh, you know, fertilized egg or sperm. But there are many, many kinds of tissue that have been cryopreserved and rewarmed. So people get the idea that, well, this is obviously not completely crazy. I'm not sure how you do a whole organism, uh, but uh, the basic science seems to be there. Plus, they're seeing uh, medical professionals see people donating organs. They see that the initial processes involved in, in donating organs is very similar to what we do. Uh, you know, you're calling the patient, you're using various drugs to uh, reduce metabolism and to prevent things going wrong so quickly while they extract the organs. And they see us doing very similar things with our 16 medications and rapid cooling. And really, how is donating your body or your brain radically different from organ transplants. So I think they're beginning to see the parallels and how it fits into regular medicine. So it's not quite part of regular medicine in their mindset, but I think increasingly, I'm, and increasingly I try to communicate it this way, cryonics is not some strange different procedure. It really is just an extension of emergency medicine. That's all we're doing. We're stepping in when today's doctors give up and saying, give us a chance to stop things getting worse. So I think as we continue to push those parallels and explain it from that frame, I think it will become more and more accepted. Uh, and you know, we'll be pursuing many other improvements along the way, too, to reduce the damage that we do in the procedures. Um, let's uh, add one of the questions from the audience into the discussion now, because we're just touching on it. When Yusar has asked, were there any successful reanimations of animals after cryonics freezing? So are you able to say what's already been happened, either to whole animals or just say a little bit more about organs? Do individual organs get uh, lower to the kind of temperature that you use in cryonic suspension? And if that hasn't happened already, when might that be done? Uh, it's going back to me for this one. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a, so I said that there are several dozen kinds of tissues that have been cryopreserved and rewarmed successfully. It gets much harder as you go from tissues to organs to organisms. And right now, doing a whole organ is very challenging. There has been some success with kidneys that have been cryopreserved and then uh, rewarmed and implanted and a function for months. Uh, but that's been hard to repeat, although it seems that recently there's been some big breakthroughs again by the same researcher. 
Uh, doing other organs has been very challenging. Doing whole organisms, unless they're very, very small, microscopic, microscopic is very difficult because so many different kinds of tissues and different requirements. Um, so we haven't been able to do that, but a lot of people look at that and say, oh, you haven't brought anybody back, so what's the point? Which really misunderstands the whole procedure. Cryonics is really in two major parts. One is to stop things changing, stop things getting bad, and then we can afford to wait for decades or even centuries if necessary. The other part of cryonics is to use more advanced technology than we have to go in there and repair the damage, whatever it was that stopped your body functioning, whatever additional damage we might have done in the cryopreservation process, and to undo the aging process because the idea is not to bring you back until we've controlled aging. Uh, so obviously we can't do that now and there's no point even trying right now. But we are seeing progress uh, apart from improving uh, organ preservation, which has really got a lot of steam behind it, because if you could bank organs and just pull them out when you need them without having to zip them across the country, that would be fantastic. Plus the whole era of regenerative medicine, we're now seeing people actually generating organs. I think recently someone actually managed to generate an embryonic mouse kidney, I think it was, or liver or something, from just stem cells, which is pretty remarkable. So that whole idea of a uh, whole field of tissue engineering, uh, tissue regeneration, I think that also feeds into the feasibility that one day we'll be able to bring back cryonics patients. Great. Uh, Anders, I'd like to pass the same questions over to you, please. What would you say to add to that? Well, looking from a perspective of how medicine is done and is changing, we seem to be moving towards a world of much more personalized medicine. It's partially because it can be done thanks to advances in pharmacogenetics, and partially it's because you know, patients are no longer so much patients as they're becoming health customers. Not always successfully. A lot of healthcare systems are broken in all sorts of ways and there are a lot of economic constraints. But the general view that health is something that is identical in every person, that there is some central view of what proper health is and that everybody needs to be brought up to that level and nothing more, that's breaking apart. Partially this is because people are realizing that prevention is much more important than a cure. It's cheaper and avoids a lot of very costly and tricky things. And partially it is because we realize that individual bodies are very different from each other. Now this is a broad change in how medicine is done and it's probably going to take uh, not just a decade but several decades before the full force is felt. But cryonics is interesting in this uh, regard because it's of course one form of uh, treatment or at least post-mortem treatment uh, that seems to fit in here. Uh, there is another question actually you know, that, which I think is quite good and that is, uh, I think it was Alexander and Karen's point that wouldn't it be better to freeze people before they're formally dead? And the answer is, of course, it's not legally possible. Ideally, if uh, you could do a suspension process as you were in a fading off, but before all the life systems were crashing, you pro could probably do a better job. But that's not legally possible because it would, it would be a process that would, from a legal standpoint, kill you. Now, we're seeing a move towards more and more control over when your life is uh, ending. I think that in 10 years' time, most Western countries will probably be fairly liberal when it comes to voluntary ending your life. And at that point, it might be much easier to do cryonics uh, because you, you know you're going to die in a certain point in time. But this is a slow process, and it's not so much technological. It's more driven by changes in values and how we run healthcare systems. So from a hard science standpoint, it's kind of annoying because it's not going to be dependent on anything we can quantify and say much about. On the other hand, from an activist standpoint for pushing for changes in our culture, it's actually something that can be affected quite strongly. So Anders, you were bold enough to make a prediction there that within 10 years in many countries, perhaps in Western Europe, it would be legally possible for people to say they're, they know they're dying and they would like to be frozen before they officially become legally dead. That's a, a bold prediction. We'll see whether others will agree with that assessment. Anders, do you have anything to say about when it is likely that we might be able to reanimate a, a small animal that has been chronically frozen? Is that likely to happen within the next 10 years as well, or would you think that's much further out in the future? It's always possible to cheat by using a sufficiently small animal. We can freeze nematode worms and bring them back, but nobody's impressed. What would probably matter is, could you take a mouse and suspend it and restore it? And I'm skeptical if we can do that in 10 years' time. It all depends on what methods you actually use to suspend it. 
And current methods probably would require cellular repair, and we simply haven't got the tools to do that properly. My own line of research is involved, uh, involves quite a lot of brain emulation. Could you scan a brain, for example, a frozen brain, and get a functional model of that in a computer? That's also, unfortunately, decades away for large brains like ours, although, of course, mice might actually be technical feasible. I would be surprised if even that happened within 10 years. But I'm not pessimistic. I think it could be done, and I think we also should be prepared to be sometimes surprised that certain things work. There was, for example, one really good paper demonstrated that long-term potentiation, experience-dependent changes of the strength of a synaptic connection, was preserved in a cryopreserved brain. So they trained a synapse, they froze it, they brought it back, and it was still maintaining that strength of connectivity. That's really important <coughs> because long-term potentiation is believed to be the core of how we lay down our memories. That was also a very tricky experiment. I would not have believed it could be done before actually seeing the paper. So I'm rather hopeful that we're going to be very surprised. Great. Well, Natasha, uh, what's your view as to what might be changing in the next few years so as to make uh, cryonics uh, a more credible and more popular uh, uh, happening rather than what has been the case in the last 20 years? I think it needs to be approached on a twofold basis. Number one, we need more research, uh, not only at Alcor, but at a number of different facilities where students and uh, scholars come in and are exploring um, different projects that deal with not only cryonics but life extension. For example, I'm working on a project with Alcor and my H plus lab, which is looking at something that Andrews just mentioned, the nematodes. I'm working with C. elegans to look at um, their behavior before, during, and after vitrification and freezing, uh, and looking at their uh, reasons why this particular life form is used so often. It is. It's the only life form that we have today uh, which uh, DNA has been totally uh, decoded and it is the one of the most marvelous um, organisms because you can see into its structure. It's fairly um, transparent under the microscope so it's a very exciting organism to work with. And yes, this has been done many times in the past, but we're going to approach it in a new way, which we'll uh, talk about um, if and when this experiment is concluded. I'd rather not talk about it now because it is a, a private experiment. But this is what I mean, that those of us who are working in biodesign or in the sciences, in labs, uh, and devoted to chronics, need to look at where we can bring in our own fields, like mine is design, into the area of cryonics and explore what we can do. So we need more researchers, we need more scientific papers about our research, with scholarship of course, but also with visual images and um, daring projects that fall into scientific research and follow the protocols, but also are daring. Um, so I, I disagree with Anders where he states that the nematode is almost inconsequential when it gets to um, looking at life forms that have been vitrified or frozen. I think this is one that needs to be explored a little bit more thoroughly and I hope to do that. The second part of where I see this, this area going in the next 10 to 20 years is in culture. Just today um, I'd like to refer to an article that was in the New York Times and it's by a um, well-known New York Times columnist who's also a bioethicist and um, self-named probably philosopher, but he's looking at aging and he's been doing this for some time. His article today is, is really quite shocking because he's writing about on dying, it's on dash dying dash after dash your time, so it's on dying after your time. So what he's saying is when our time is up, it's up. How dare we prolong our time and die after our card has come up and said this is our dance card to die. Um, but, you know, looking at him as just one person who's, who's a social um, um, counter, uh, he's been writing about this since the 1980s, and he's even written a book about um, his uh, offense to the defense coming online to him. Uh, the earlier book was Setting Limits, Medical Goals is an 
in an aging society, and then he did a rebuttal to the, the complaints about that book. Now, the complaints were basically about his intervention, and they were before their time. If we look today, now it is time to have this social challenge and this, at this ethical issue about life extension. Um, he quoted in 2013 in another one of his New York Times articles, our society cannot and should not promise open-ended, progress-driven medical care that is indifferent to cost. So he's speaking about this as an economist, philosopher slash bioethicist. And I think that we can argue that the cost of chronics and the cost of life extension is has not gone up to the cost of medical care. And why do we have high costs of medical care? Feasibly because people are not taking care of themselves at the level they can take care of themselves by a healthy diet, healthy exercise. With obesity um, growing exponentially in many countries around the world, I know in England, in London, I, I saw it when I was there last, as well as in the United States, it's become a bit of a habit and maybe a pandemic, um, this overeating and bad food. So we've been countering that with, with certain diets like the uh, paleo diet and health and exercise, but we need to counter it as a, as a society, as a culture much more strongly through a proactive stance, through a not Pollyanna stance, but a very rational, objective look at where we are, where we can be going, and how life extension is not one person's determinant that we must die when our card is, is due. I say let's get different dance cards. Let's get different dance cards. Great. Well, uh, and we can expect that the different dance cards will come in part because more scientists are daring to do some experimentation which is relevant to this and gradually there'll be a change in opinion about what is possible and what's not possible. Mm. Nice. Garrett, would you like to, would, Garrett, can you comment on these questions and if you have any views as to what's likely to be different in the next 10 years from the previous 20 um, years, say? Yes, I, I wanted to um, pick up the, the business of the background cultural change um, because when I was first involved and, and as I said before, it was very hard to persuade anyone that there would be significant progress in life extension. And now, of course, that's fairly well accepted. Um, <clears throat> people would constantly quote whichever section of the Bible it is that says three score years and ten, 70 years. It was like average lifespan in the 80s. And basically, people were saying, well, when your time's up, your time's up, which is a way of another way you can put that round another way which is I can't be bothered to think about this um, and I don't want to talk about it <coughs> so you just say well the way it is things are the way they are and I don't seem to think they should be different and it's to some extent making a virtue of necessity but I've noticed in the last however many years I no one ever says because now it's sort of accepted that lifespan is around about 80 in the industrialized nations so no one ever quotes that little Bible thing. It's when somehow that proved that they were right and I was wrong back in the 80s, and here we are in uh, the 2010s, no one says it at all. It's completely dropped because, of course, it looks silly. And, in fact, actually it's evidence that we're right. So um, <laughs> to some extent, cultural change, I mean, it lags on technological change. Uh, but, yeah, we one of the, one of the things is, I mean, if you look at something like the moonshot um, in 1969, an amazing thing, but it was driven by the most massive subsidies because of the Cold War and whatnot, all of that background history. We're just about now beginning to get the whole background technology to be have <coughs> a commercial space flight. And even then, I mean, it's still partly because governments are paying for things to go up, um, creating the market. But the technology they were doing it within the 60s was so advanced for, for what it was that there just wasn't any commercial application that you could do, really. Um, I mean, one of the encouraging things, enormously encouraging things now, is that I was talking to um, someone who'd been at University, Singularity University, and there's a spin-off from it called the Organ Preservation Alliance that are attempting to get a sort of an X prize for organ storage, for doubling the time in organ storage. Um, um, in the German group, um, 
eye that I was talking to when they were over here recently, uh, <coughs> a couple of them had been given backing to to very small startup with very little money at the moment, but they are people involved in Cryonix who are also involved in trying to commercialize products connected with cryobiology and cryonics. Um, so uh, I think you know the really big difference will be made when someone starts to repeat the things like the vitrification of organs the, such as a kidney or have a bigger one. Um, and again I'll mention before the BBC I want to, something I want to come back to the business of uh, Dara Brian Science Club. <coughs> I'll give you a link. Um, Daryl O'Brien Science Club, which is shown on the BBC here. So he's he's got a good scientific background, it seems himself, and his programs are <laughs> yeah, quite well yes. watched. And generally, he knows what he's talking about. So it seems. Um, I I think there's a thing here for putting up slides, isn't there? Or is there? You click the screen share button if you have some slides ready. If we can uh, look at them quickly. Maybe you can uh, get them ready, and we can look at them yeah, shortly. Yeah, I'll maybe I'll do after that. After the discussion moves on, okay. Yeah, um, I will. I will just well, the thing about that is, is um, the very frustrating thing about it. I'll send, or I'll put up a link or something. He actually mentioned starts off talking about um, cryonics, um, and uh, it was a program sent put out in the summer, supposedly by the BBC Science Unit, and he's talking to a professional scientist, um, and they mock cryonics horribly. And quite wrongly, they get a carrot that was formerly frozen and squeezes it, and of course, you know, mush comes out. <coughs> this apparently proves that cryonics can't work. I mean, interestingly, but to be clear, for people who are listening, for people who are listening who are not quite sure of the difference, uh, cryonics isn't just freezing people and then uh, bring uh, heating them up again. It does something quite different to the liquids and fluids that are inside the body. Is that correct? It, it's enormously yes, yes. I mean, it's enormously different. I mean, one of the interesting things I'm looking at Anders here, and at the beginning, Darabrian starts the thing off by saying, "Oh, well, this was very." popular in the 60s and 70s and in fact three Oxford academics have recently signed up for it and I always think oh I know who they are um, and uh, and then they go on to talk nonsense and they have a, an, a, a cringing example um, of, of creating crystals which has got nothing whatsoever to do with vitrification or anything like that and I finally found the, um, the one of the presenters the other presenter was Mark Miodovnik um, he's at UCL or somewhere respectable like that. You'd sort of think, oh, well, surely he would look this up properly. Um, and I uh, found his Twitter thing, Twitter address, and tweeted him um, a link to Greg Fay's work on uh, kidney preservation. So I'm hoping that something like that will make a difference. A part of it is there are people in the media that just keep pumping out the same old absolute nonsense. Um, one of that sort of social difference. That, that, that actually has is, is happened here. Um, I was listening to Anders being interviewed on the radio on today on Radio 4. I, I don't know if you actually went into the studio or, or if it was on the phone. But um, the presenter himself, uh, with, Max had been to Oxford, uh, of course, as well. Um, the presenter himself, I looked up afterwards, had been to Oxford. And I remember the presenter, with slight, you know, I had a slight grinding of the teeth as, as he said it, because he said that you were academics from Oxford and it wasn't like these other people that had signed up before who he obviously thought were had some kind of personality disorder or some kind of problem like that. He said, you know, obviously you're normal intelligent people, you know, with the implication being that I'm not. And I, and I think partly that was slightly annoying. But also partly, when I look at it the other way around, what a relief that someone like that is now no longer, we've got one more person there in the media who isn't going to immediately dismiss it as something bonkers. And part of it is there have been these breakthroughs. There are these startup companies. Um, there was an article about the UK Cryonics Group um, a few months ago in The Guardian, which had some very positive comments at the bottom in the comments section, and some of them were very mean. Um, not to say quite abusive, and I um, clicked the abuse button on one of them, and I couldn't find it. I was looking earlier on today. I think they may have actually had the good sense to remove it. But I mean, anybody listening, if you're looking at something like that, please do come in on the comments. And if someone says something like, "I think they should all die anyway; they don't deserve to live," what other topic would the Guardian 
op, you know, the, the people that run the, the comment section of something like The Guardian allow you to say you think everybody should die, they deserve it. They wouldn't. They'd have that removed immediately. yet. Yeah, but for us, we have to actually complain about it. So let's complain about it. Let's get people, have, take us seriously one person at a time if it has to be. And that's the and any part of your complaining. Yeah. Part of your complaining, Garrett, I understand, is you are reactivating a blog or you're writing a blog from now on, a cryo blog on uh, yes. this very topic. The, the staggeringly unimaginative title of cryoblog.com um, has gone live. Okay, I think the, the content, the content, will be more important than the yes. Than well, the I'm hoping, title. Yes, and I'm, you. And sorry, go on. And we've also seen recently some uh, videos from Max Moore on YouTube, very nice uh, short videos, uh, about four to seven minutes each addressing questions. So I, I believe that uh, with uh, good use of modern social media, including blogs, including comments on uh, newspaper articles, including YouTube videos, uh, we can present more of the information in a more balanced way and the more and more people should pick things up. That's my hope anyway, and I think that's a, a reasonable expectation. Let's move on to some of the other questions, if I may. David, I'd David like can I just make a quick comment on that? Yes, please do, Max. Yeah, because, yeah. uh, you know, we'll talk about how, how idiotic a lot of the criticisms of cryonics are, um, and this does come up again and again. Um, you know, I can think of the Crossfire debate I did back in 2002, where I debated Jonathan Marino, who's, you know, pretty top bioethicist, but he came on knowing exactly zero about cryonics and his his attempt to refute it essentially was to just deride what I was saying just to make fun of it and say this is like trying to jump from here to the moon that was the level of his argumentation um, and more recently if you look around YouTube and you'll see I'm about to do a response to this Michio Kaku who presumably is a pretty smart oh. intelligent fellow does a lot of popular science shows he has the most staggeringly stupid criticism of cryonics he obviously has not bothered to do his research just like all these other smart critics who think they already know everything about this topic without actually doing any research. So he's talking about freezing things and ice growing inside the cells and expanding and blowing them up, which is just not what happens even if you don't cryoprotect, it's not, not accurate. Dara O'Brien said that as well. Yeah, they're always saying that, but they well, don't actually I'm... bother to do five minutes of Googling to, to see whether that actually applies or not. Uh, and by the way, for those who don't know, go look at what actually happens. Unless you drop temperature very, very rapidly, what happens actually is water leaves the cells um, and ice forms outside the cells. Uh, and that does do some damage, but it's not causing the cells to explode from the inside. That's not how it works. And of course, you know, uh, David used the term freeze, and we try to avoid that term because really freezing is the formation of ice crystals as you lower temperature. And that's something we avoid as much as possible, and hopefully completely in a good case. Uh, by removing blood and body fluids and replacing them with cryoprotectants, kind of a medical grade antifreeze. So we don't like to use the term freeze because that's really not what we're doing. Um, but yeah, we have to keep hammering away at these points because people keep saying the same stupid things, the same arguments about overpopulation, which are so 1960s, uh, you know, about ice exploding, uh, how can you bring back dead people, not understanding that these are not dead people any more than someone who stops breathing for a few minutes in a hospital. I think we have to keep hammering away at these critics and as I've done with Michio Kaku, and this should be online in the next week or two, uh, challenge them and say, take back what you said or yes, face me and debate me directly. And that's my challenge to Michio Kaku, so we'll see how he responds. Good. But we have to keep hitting those points over and over. Tim Gibson of the, um, of the he's an ALCO member in, in Sheffield and runs the uh, Cryonics UK group was saying to me the other day the number of phone calls they get are, get, are more, getting more and more and frequently they phone up and say are you the people that freeze dead people and he says no we're not because they're not dead and we don't freeze them and I thought well that's a nice blunt uh, straightforward answer of course it takes some explanation to go with it but that is a it is, it is, this, well actually you know the, I was I thought um, it was Douglas Adams that had said this, but it turns out to be JBS Haldane, uh, who I've got a link to here somewhere, but um, I won't put it, put it up, who uh, had the four stages of some new idea coming up, and one of which is it's utterly ridiculous. Um, I can't be bothered to talk about it. The next is um, uh, it won't work, and the next, the next stage is and it won't work, and here's why. And the next stage is, well, there might be something to it, but it'll never be of any use. And the last stage is, I said that all along. Um, and <laughs> I actually looked it up where that came from. And he published, it was in a, a book review 
he he wrote of a book that came out in 1963 about people's lifespan called called the truth about death, um, which I thought was quite intriguing. That 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 was specifically the kind of topic we're talking about. Um, but it's interesting to see where we are along the um, those stages because with different people we're at different places. Is with Michio Kaku, and as you say, it's almost as if the more educated they are, the the more quick they are to dismiss it. Bizarrely. Well, let's uh, uh, at this stage let's put in a question from Jay Diamond, who is actually asking uh, for for evidence. Jay Diamond's question uh, is, what evidence is there that the current preservation process will eventually result in successful rejuvenation or resurrection? So we're saying that to people who are critical of this often don't get the point, but uh, let, let's say, uh, who would like to address this question? Well, first of all, can we not use the term resurrection? Because this is, again, like freezing dead people. It's getting us into the space of we're dealing with dead people. We're some kind of alternative to a mortuary. Uh, and that's not the way we want to frame this. It's not an accurate framing. Uh, again, we're an extension of emergency medicine. You don't talk about you know, hospitals dealing with dead people. You talk about them trying to keep people alive. Um, so I just want to make that point, first of all. Um, but I think some of the evidence that eventually this is feasible is that you can look at uh, electromicrograph, electromicrograph studies of vitrified brain tissue, and you can see that the connectome is intact. Under decent conditions, and we can't always guarantee perfect conditions, it looks like what we're doing works. Everything we know about memory, which is not complete yet, but it's still um, it's pretty, it's pretty solid what we know, I think, about long-term memory storage. We are preserving that under decent conditions. Uh, we've also recently at Alcor been doing CT scans in pursuit of evidence-based cryonics. You know, before, we couldn't really look inside the skull and see how well we cryopreserved the brain. Um, we just did the best we could and hope it worked out. But now we can actually do CT scans, and we can see, based on the electron densities, how much ice is in there, how much cryoprotectin is in there, what the brain tissue is, maybe tumor. Um, we can figure out what's going on, and we can see how different protocols, different ischemic delays affect the quality of the cryopreservation. And it's very clear that, for instance, in a case like Fred Chamberlain, the co-founder of Alcor, uh, who we cryopreserved about a year ago, um, he was right here in Scottsdale, checked into a hospice locally, uh, refused food and water, and so could time his his exit, if you like, his temporary exit. And we're right there by his bedside and had an extremely fast response. And his vascular system was in good shape, so it went well. And when we CT scanned his brain, it looks exactly how it should look. It looks fantastic. So we think there is pretty solid reason to think that, given some technological advance, what makes you you, what makes your memories exist, your personality, uh, is still there and is potentially recoverable. So we have direct evidence of that kind. Max used a phrase Gosh. there that I was sorry. Ma Ma uh, I'd like to say something. Yeah, thank go you. On. Um, I think one way we can we can recognize uh, that there is um, more of a probability than a um, and a feasibility than an impracticality of chronics is looking at how the other advances are, are paralleling new structures for the human body. I mean. I, I always use this, and it, and, it, and it seems to get the point across very clearly. If we look at the field of prosthetics and what's going on in prosthetics, it has advanced so enormously, even over the last five years, but look over the past 20 years, how prosthetics has advanced. And these individuals who have prosthetic arms or prosthetic legs would have been considered to be um, deformed or abnormal or... Um, you know, the others, the, the ones that can't get around that VR, they handicap. But now they are the more enabled. Um, and looking at human enhancement in this way brings them into the foreground of culture as spearheaders, as, as um, you know, really um, strong-minded and creative individuals who would dare to have robotic AI-driven prosthetic parts rather than sitting in a wheelchair. And they, they do get standing ovations when giving you know, talks at conferences that I've been at on stage with them, especially uh, when we look at uh, gold um, Olympic champions um, and look at any of the models, the beautiful women who have prosthetic um, replacement parts. So we're seeing where society is becoming more accustomed to looking at those who have overcome these very obvious odds. If we could parallel that with overcoming the very obvious odds of death as 
being, you know, those being brave hearts and being, you know, strong individuals and setting an example, I think that would, would help steer the, um, the realization that this is occurring. But just getting back to your question, David, I think it's so obvious visually in front of us that there are people walking around who would have been considered dead without enhancement parts. And so basically, Chronix is at this level today considered to be a human enhancement protocol because it's giving an alternative to the finality of death. So I just wanted to toss that in there because I'd like us to, to get a little bit outside of the attitude of chronics and learn the terminology here about vitrification versus freezing and a partial death rather than final death and take a look at how people can look at chronics as a possibility when considering prosthetics and different body types based on the medicine of stem cells and prosthetic parts. Anybody else want to chip in on the evidence question or should we move um, on? Yes, yes, I, I was, I'm very encouraged to hear the, uh, well, obviously I'm biased, I've known Max for years, but I'm very encouraged to hear the leader of Alcor using the term evidence-based cryonics um, because the difference really um, I, and here's, here's the problem, I think, that ultimately when Ev Cooper and uh, Robert Ettinger had the idea, or in, independently came up with the idea of cryonics in the, was it, well, it was published in the early 60s, um, the, the brilliant bit, the, the, this really thing that no one had ever thought of before, because freezing people had been thought of before, suspended animation had been thought of before. The bit that he specifically, Ettinger, I think, picked up on was that you didn't have to fix everything right now, that technology will move ahead, and even if we do some damage when we're freezing people and we don't know how to cure what they've died of, at some point in the far, if be it distant future, they'll find a way of doing it. That was the brilliant step that was added that no one had done before. The problem is that's also... I mean, the seeds of its chronic destruction are in that step as well. The problem with that step is it allows people to not do evidence-based cryonics, uh, and as so much of it historically has been like that, because people will just say, oh, we can always fix it in the future. And to a regular person who isn't a visionary or eccentric <coughs> or however you want to call us, they just look at it and think, oh, these people aren't really, you know, this isn't going anywhere and it doesn't work and they're just all saying one day something magical will happen and they just view it as being something magical. Um, and that's partly, I think, why we don't ever catch on in big numbers. Um, but, I mean, it's so encouraging to know, for example, that patients are being CT scanned and that kind of thing. So we are beginning to build up evidence and we can see what we're doing right and see what we're doing wrong. And as I said, just it's such a relief to hear that the practice of evidence-based cryonics coming from evidence-based medicine, uh, that it's being done. So thank you. Yeah. If I could just add to that just briefly, David. Um, that's, you know, I'm really pushing that a lot at Alcor. There are other things we can do. We can, for instance, do biopsies, although this is controversial within the membership, so we have to sort of explain, first of all, how, how we do this and why there's no damage involved. Um, and get members to agree to it. CT scans, I think, we're going to do as a default procedure unless anybody objects, because it's incredibly valuable. Uh, there's a lot of other things we could do to gather more information. You know, we, we have high-definition videos of the surgeries, so we get feedback from our medical people on how we've done and how we can improve things. We're measuring as many variables as we can, so and as much of that as possible we make public. Obviously not videos of surgery on patients, but as much as we can we put out there in case reports. I think it's really important for us to be as public and open as possible uh, so that people you know, can look inside and don't think we're weird. And what does the biopsies show? Well, we what haven't is been the doing benefit this. of doing biopsies? It would be tell you something about how well you've got the uh, perfusate into neural tissue or into the spinal cord, for instance, um, to look at actual you know, direct evidence of how much ice formation, whether you've eliminated it completely. Um, there's other things we can do, so I'm really encouraging our research people to weigh in on what can we do without slowing down the process, you know, how can we get more information about how well or not well we're doing. And rather than try to hide any shortcomings, I'm saying, well, let's just face them and see how we can improve things going forward. Okay, let's look at the question that uh, Lena Chen, sorry, Lena Chi has asked. Uh, she asks, if she, I sign up for cryonics preservation. How do I know that my body will not be unexpectedly discarded, affected by unpredictable events? 
it seems like there can't really be any guarantee for a procedure like that. Who would like to respond to that question? Well, yeah, there's no guarantee of, of anything that's uh, highly experimental. If you had experimental heart surgery or experimental cancer treatment, there's no guarantee that it's going to work, that it won't have side effects. So that's certainly true. However, we can do a lot to minimize the risks that something will go wrong. Uh, for instance, at Alcor, we have the Patient Care Trust Fund, and when you're cryopreserved, a big chunk of the money you paid us goes into that, that fund, and we don't touch that uh, for operations. We use that only for your indefinite upkeep. And I think it relates to a question that someone else asked about. Is there a specific time frame that you can store someone? And the answer is no. The idea is that we're funding this uh, for indefinite care. So we only use the earnings on those funds to pay for upkeep for the good nitrogen, viewers, and other direct costs. The capital should actually keep increasing over time because we try not to draw more than about 2% a year, and that should be sustainable for a very long time. So you know, we do our best to think very long term. Um, you know, we're not a for-profit organization. We're a tax-exempt nonprofit. That seems to be generally have better longevity. Um, and we think of other risks. You know, how can we safeguard against unlikely events? Any event is unlikely in one year, like an attack by some you know, religious fanatic for some reason. Uh, but wait several decades, and it might well happen. So we always try to think about what could we do to reduce those kinds of risks. Uh, what happens if we have World War III and there's no liquid nitrogen available for uh, more than six months, when it will become a real problem. Well, we have backup plans for creating our own liquid nitrogen. Um, so no, there's no guarantee, but uh, we think very carefully and very hard about how to keep people cryopreserved for the very long term. And the actual cost of storage isn't that large because it's quite a, it's a stable thing. It doesn't require lots of machinery running around. It's a, a quite a small amount of space that's occupied by each person. Especially if you're a neuropatient, um, in which case you know, we can store 10 times as many neuropatients in the same volume as a whole body patient. Um, but yeah, it also depends on the efficiency of the containers, and there's quite an art to engineering these things. Uh, it is very quite a lot over time. Uh, but we figure that uh, you know, to generate that 2%, we're currently putting 115,000 of the 200,000 for whole body patients in the patient care trust fund. And I think for neuros, it's about 25,000. Uh, but we're always looking for ways to reduce that cost by changing the configuration of, of the dewars, and thinking about alternatives, improving the performance. Um, yeah, the actual cost for neuropatients is pretty small, but you do have to pay for not just liquid nitrogen. The dewars probably will last decades, but also you know, patient care, people have to check on it, uh, alarm systems, rental space. So there are various expenses like that. But you know, compared to any major surgery, this is an amazingly inexpensive, <laughs> a really good deal, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, Anders, I'd like to bring you in on this probability question because I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about risks and probabilities. So how do you assess the probabilities and likelihoods that uh, chronic suspension may be the best approach forwards compared to some of the other approaches that people talk about? Well, For example, well, there's a suggestion further down here about why don't we just do the brain plastination, which is a, a different kind of approach altogether that people like Ken Hayworth do. Uh, so. How do you assess what uh, technology is likely to be effective in uh, this kind of uh, long-term uh, clinical care? And uh, what odds do you put on it? Is this a kind of a one in a hundred chance that you're taking, or is it closer to 50% or higher that you would evaluate it? When I was considering whether to sign up for cryonics or not, I did this mental calculation But what's my life worth to me? And then I started comparing that to the monthly cost of paying the life insurance that would pay for my contract. And I realized that even if I believed it was just one chance in 60 that cryonics could work, it would still be a good economic deal. Now, you might disagree here on my probability estimates or how much I value my own life. I might be unusually narcissistic, perhaps, but it still made sense to me. And it's an interesting problem how to make good uh, reasoning under radical uncertainty, because I think the problem for cryonics is that it's based on reasoning about technology that doesn't quite exist yet. In fact, it's about technology that we have very little clue about in many cases. We understand the suspension process to some extent, but the fact that evidence-based cryonic, evidence cryonics is still such a young area, that's a little bit discouraging and worrying. We have some ideas about how we might be getting out of DURs eventually, but again, they're based on rather strong extrapolations of our technology. 
What we can do, however, is we can compare risks and try to see which ones are orders of magnitude larger than others. So it seems like in the case of being suspended for a long time, eventually, sooner or later, some bad uh, event will hit you. Because there is a finite probability of something bad happening every year, even if it's very low. It turns out mathematically that, that if the probability goes down fast enough, there is a finite probability of surviving forever. But in practice, that's not going to happen. We're in, uh, living on a planet which is pretty dynamic and contains a lot of uh, sometimes violent changes. So if cryonics doesn't uh, succeed in bringing people back over a century or two, then existential risks and global catastrophic risks will totally tend to dominate, which might again be a good motivator for us who are uh, signed up to try to reduce existential risk while we're up and running. For shorter periods of time, it seems like the risk might be more dominated by institutional risks. Uh, but again, that's something we can do something useful about. But getting back to the question about future technology and plastination, the idea of plastination is to, instead of using low temperature to stop chemical reactions, instead to fix everything in place by uh, having some polymers uh, you know, con uh, replacing water. This has the lovely property that you don't need to keep things at liquid nitrogen temperatures. It also has an uncomfortable side effect that, yeah, some chemical reactions might be happening, but we can't move very far. And we don't really know whether that is going to be a major inhibitor of bringing people back or not. It partially depends on your assumptions about what you can achieve, especially if you, like me, think that brain emulation might be a great way of getting out of being in a frozen or suspended state. In that case, of course, it might not matter very much, except if there's some subtle chemical changes that might be happening during plastination. But uh, in the end, the bottom line is, if you want to plastinate yourself, you still need to have a suspension in calm and fill your body with chemicals and do that in a very careful manner. So you're still going to need something very much like Alcor or any other cryonics organization. It's not like you can do it on your own or uh, just go to your local undertaker. So it seems like I think Alcor is certainly going to be in business, but maybe we're going to be offering plastination too. Natasha, what's your view on that? I was looking at the, the questions by the, uh, the viewers and listeners, and one point I'd like to make here is that I don't think this is necessarily to be viewed at as competition. I think that when we're talking about something as precious as our lives and living longer and protecting our lives, that we have to see it as cooperation, that there may be other vehicles for extending life, but we need to be as logical as possible about what works now and what offers the best options for us. So I don't see plastination as competition to cryonics. Um, so let's, let's move that concept aside. I think that there's ways that they can work together. And let me follow up on what Andrew's saying. Um, plastination is a very interesting idea since we're in a, an environment today of neurology and, and cognitive science, which are two fields that have, are getting more and more um, mention and very important for backing up the brain and looking at, you know, proving or sustaining our identity, etc. But it's very lethal. It's you're, you're just freezing, let's use freezing, a part of the brain in as it's plasticized and then the big work comes in where you've got to start connecting the synapses of the neurons so you can maybe stop the brain and get a direct copy of it, a duplicate, but unless you get so many of those and put them together and then start understanding what goes on between the neurons in their communication, it's, it's just like doing a piece of sculpture, which may be very beautiful to look at, but it is sculpture, it's non-functioning. I think that we need to look at cryonics today as the base, as the best option, uh, possibly as far as not causing such uh, toxic reactions in the body. The profusion has become, has become through vitrification much more gentle to the body, where plastination is, is very, very toxic. So. However, I'm going to pass this on to Max in a moment. I think that there are ways that the two fields could work together, and I think it fits under the, the area of where cryonics can look at different elements of the brain in dealing with the, the connections between the neurons, the synapses, and the communication there, as well as preserving our identity, our personhood. 
So co-optation, which is after all how many other fields of technology advance so much with companies who are fierce competitors but who are nevertheless able to share insights in, from each other. Max, what's your view on the, the possibility of a competition or cooperation with plastination? How do you assess that? Well, first of all, I'd like to point out to, to people who are listening and watching that uh, there's a really good article on this topic from uh, January 2013, Cryonics Magazine. So if you go to alcohol.org and um, I think where it says more information, Cryonics Magazine, uh, you'll find the January issue a really good discussion of, of chemopreservation. Um, yeah, there's no, no real exclusion of chemopreservation at alcohol. We could do this, but a lot of people don't realize it is doing that successfully is very complex. It's not just a matter of you know, dunking a brain in a bucket of chemicals and letting those uh, find their way in there. It's actually a very complex process. It requires the same kind of emergency response that we do for cryonics. There's no good waiting for several days before you try to get some uh, uh, plastic resin into the brain. You've got to get moving very fast. And um, it's actually a tough process. The way it's done right now involves some pretty toxic chemicals, um, you know, much more problematic than what we use in cryonics. So it really require a massive effort to make this even remotely workable. Uh, the problem also is that getting resin into the brain, uh, all the way into the brain, is not very easy. Even with a mouse brain, it apparently takes a long, long time during which chemical reactions are still going on, metabolism is still proceeding, things are deteriorating. Um, and if you multiply that to a human brain, you know, the time scale zooms out enormously. Um, and you'll probably never actually get all the way into the brain. It, it'll get stuck in the outer ring of the brain. So it's going to be very hard actually to get a, a human brain properly fixed. Um, however, if somehow those problems could be overcome, alcohol would be in an ideal position to offer that service. It was a proven method uh, because we have the standby teams, we have those emergency response uh, protocols in place. So if it was a viable method, uh, we would go, you know, we'd offer that as an alternative or addition to what we do. And just whilst we're on this uh, topic, uh, uh, Max, there's another question on this by Callum Chase, who, as you may see, he says he's intrigued by your comment that you can actually see that uh, the connectome, that's the brain connections of your patients, is preserved. How deeply do you actually scan the patient's brains? Can you go deep without risking damage? And I, I know Callum is particularly interested in this. I think he's written a novel in which uh, scanning of the brain is uh, a major research interest of at least some of the key characters in the novel. Um, Anders can probably comment on the you know, technical aspects of these better than I can, but I'd like to clarify that there's two different kinds of scanning going on right now. Uh, CT scans are what we've been doing recently. That doesn't tell us anything about how well we're preserving things at the micro scale. It's really telling us at a, a more overall level how much ice formation or prevention of ice formation we have and you know, how much tumor, um, how much water is in the brain, that kind of thing. It's not really telling us how well we've preserved the synaptic connections. That's what electron micrograph studies do. Um, and those we don't, you know, we don't take chunks of tissue out of the brain and do those. Those are more from experiments on animals, uh, not from our patients. So uh, I don't, I can't really answer the question about if you if you were to do that on an actual sample, um, what damage that would do. CT scans don't seem to do any damage. I mean, people get CT scans all the time. Um, I don't know how feasible it would be to do electron micrograph studies of actual patients. I don't think that's really feasible. So you have to do it on tissue samples instead. Like Anders could probably Anders? address that quite well. Yeah, I think it's going to be ethically kind of tricky to do uh, the biopsies of patients. Uh, but from a scientific perspective, it's interesting the advances that is happening right now in connectomics. While most talk about connectomics is looking at the overall network in the brain, which is very interesting from a scientific perspective, what really matters in this case is, of course, looking at the microscopic network, the microcircuits, and how well they are preserved. So some of the lovely work coming out of Sebastian Sung's lab is really important here. He's working on the retina, which might perhaps be something that uh, ethically could be removed from a, a frozen customer, but I think uh, more importantly, it's a good test subject because there is both, both scientific interest in figuring out exactly how it works, and is well constrained. We actually know the science. So the method he's using to trace neurons, in about five years or so, I would expect that they're fully formed. Right now, it's very early days. Then 
know, once we have those methods, we're probably going to be able to apply them to really test how well cryonics has worked. In the long run, of course, the big question is, if you believe in a certain versions of personal identity and whether software can be conscious, maybe you could be re recovered from your connectome. Not everybody would agree on that. The list of philosophical and scientific assumptions is enormous uh, if you want to believe that. But still, the practical thing of using this to test the practical methods of uh, cryonics seems to be really worthwhile. So actually having good ways of checking the connectome, that might be developed both as a result of current connectomics and the Obama Brain Project, which is also kind of starting out. So we might actually see some really amazing tools here for checking the integrity of the patients. So the new tools may be available which will give us greater insight fairly soon as to what's actually going on inside people's brains, whether they are suspended or not. Garrett, you wanted to say something on this as well, I think? Just on plastination versus vitrification. Um, as far as I know, not a single cell has been recovered live from plastination. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but not any tissue sample or anything has ever been brought back to life or unplastinated. Um, but of course, enormous numbers of cells. There are people that were frozen as embryos, and you can vitrify and in many cases freeze a lot of small samples. And Isamu Suda, who's a professor, Japanese professor, in the 1960s froze a non-human brain for, I, I think it was six years, and thawed it out and got brain, integrated brain waves from it. So, uh, you know, plastination, no cells whatever, freezing a whole brain. Which one but isn't, you, the, uh, isn't, your isn't the method, isn't the approach different? It's not trying to reanimate the brain after it's been plastinated. The idea is to copy it. Uh, plastinate, well, to keep it, keep it out it. alive. You must, you've probably done an awful lot of damage. I mean, okay. <clears throat> you know, one, one has integrated brain waves. You can't have done that much damage. But we have no idea how much damage we've done in plastination. But one way we might be able to find that out is actually to start comparing what we can reconstruct from these connectomes in test systems. So right now there are various people working on, for example, restoring the C. elegans nematode uh, worm from uh, scanned sections, essentially creating simulations of nematode worms. Now, that might not be recovering to life a particular worm. It might be making a copy of it. And again, we can get into a lovely philosophy debate about it. Yeah. Uh, but I do agree that uh, the freezing approach, um, you have everything original there, and uh, it's not hopefully not changing very much. Plastination introduces a lot of very new variables we know very little about. And that is a good reason to be cautious about it. Okay, we've been having a, a fine discussion here. Uh, I was pleased to hear that Alcor said that uh, if there are new technologies which become uh, proven and become more in demand, then some of the same care facilities would be able to be adapted to include these as well. Uh, let's move on to the last few questions. We only have about 15 minutes left of the time allocated. There are at least four audience questions which I would like to try and get the panel to comment on. The one with the highest number of votes is by Jack Stringer, the one that we haven't looked at yet, and he's asking about the costs. He is saying that it's still quite expensive to go full body cryonics. Uh, what chance is that the cost uh, will come down uh, in the next 50 years or even even sooner than that. So who would like to answer the question of costs? And Max, I think you have a video in which you look at the question of whether cryonics is just for rich people. Yeah, currently it's actually rather more affordable than many people realize. Uh, simply most people hear 80,000 for an euro, 200,000 for a whole body and say, oh, forget about that then, not realizing that they can use life insurance to pay for it. And that's pretty cheap if you're a young, healthy person. Um, it has gotten more expensive over time, but I think that's partly because uh, at Alcor we really transformed from a very volunteer organization in the early days to a much more professional organization. And that, you know, that produces an increase in costs as you make that transformation. But we've already reached that stage pretty much now, so I wouldn't expect those kind of cost increases to go on in the future. And if we can grow, and this is kind of a big challenge for me right now, if we could double our membership, we could do so with the same number of staff that we have. We could have 10 times as many members with probably a very small increase in staff. That would bring down 
the membership dues greatly, so we really could achieve economies of scale. Now, could we reduce the cost of other aspects? That would be tough. Um, you know, we have some very good procedures now for standby and stabilization and transport, and there are real costs involved in doing that. It would be hard to get that down a whole lot, I think. Storage, I think there are some possible ways of reducing storage costs further, and we're currently discussing that. Um, but really, I think the operational costs can be brought down through economies of scale. So I think that, that will happen if we can grow. So please, if you're watching this, sign up. Boost our membership numbers. You'll be saving everybody's lives by cutting costs and making it more affordable. And yes. that's how many other industries, of course, have worked, isn't it? The industries uh, cut costs when they're able to achieve scale. And often the costs can come down in unexpected ways simply because there's more people involved, more brains involved, more companies participating. So success breeds success. Yes, can I add um, <clears throat> to that? Um, of course, economies of scale would make a huge difference, um, as it has with anything else. So, so, so I'm making a plea to people to join up. And if you're a transhumanist out there, you've been watching this, you watch a lot of the transhumanist stuff and, and are involved and all the rest of it, I'd like to tell you a short, a short story about a very religious man who used to, he felt that he should win the lottery. And he was a very pious man, and he did a lot of very good things, and he used to go into the church every day and say, look, I've done I spent a whole day doing good things. Please, God, let me win the lottery. And eventually, God decided that he was, a very, he was his best, one of the best people on earth. He'd just done so many good things, um, and he even knew that if he won the lottery, the guy would probably spend that on charitable events. And God decided, okay, I'll let him win the lottery. So the man was there praying that night in church, and he praying away, saying, please, can I win the lottery? And he heard, hears the voice of God booming down to him from above, and he says, of course, my son, I will let you win the lottery, but you must do one thing first. And the man says, well, what is it? What is it? Of course I'll do it. Tell me, tell me. Before you win the lottery, you've got to buy a ticket. <laughs> and <laughs> um, listen, <laughs> economies of scale would make a difference. If all of the people watching here today would buy the damn ticket, it would make it cheaper for all of us. And we'd have more money for research. So, buy the ticket. Thank you. Very Thank good. You good, st a good story. Okay. Good story. Are you a comedian in, a, in, in your spare time, Garrett? I, I did at one time try that, yes. <laughs> It seems to be there's a there's a well-known academic in in um, in Oxford that used to do that as well. Indeed, well, we, won't, we won't talk about him. I, I can tell you about some of and I'll tell you about some of the material he used to do at some stage as well. You'd be quite surprised, doesn't he? You okay. wouldn't. Think well, he, let's let's look at another objection to signing up. No, no, let's look at another objection to signing up. This is an objection raised by Rebecca Cron in her question. She says, if your family has no interest in taking part in the Chronics project, uh, are you plotting a future life in which your current relationships will have no meaning? Uh, does it make sense for individuals to sign up by themselves without the support of their family? I think uh, it does make sense, but uh, it's a bit like traveling abroad without your family. It's not going to be uh, as enjoyable, and you might indeed lose out on something. Uh, I, I kind of feel the, uh, about this, since I live apart from my family who are over in Sweden. Of course, it's much easier for me to just go on a plane and visit them than if I've been suspended and now ended up a century in the future away from them. But this is not an argument against cryonics. It's rather an argument uh, for getting your family members to sign up. I think it's also an important uh, counter-argument because quite a lot of people in cryonics tend to look at the technical uh, perspective or the uncertainties and the economics. But of course, we're very social beings. We actually do care about each other. And that makes this a surprisingly strong argument. Uh, and I think we need to, to uh, carefully take into account that, yes, we want our relationships to last, but that's, of course, why we want uh, to have cryonics and life extension in the first place. The point of doing cryonics is not to be frozen. That's kind of a side effect. The point of cryonics is to be around in order to enjoy life. So I think we should actually work very hard to make sure that we have relationships that can last. And, of course, if you're frozen, you might even want to have children or grandchildren who might remember that uh, crazy old guy or that uh, fun uncle and want to have him back. 
that might be a really good insurance. <laughs> Anybody like else to want to? Yes, yeah, I, I'd like to add. If we look back over time, we've changed our relationships since we were children and had new relationships as adolescents and even different relationships in our early 20s and 30s and those of us who are fortunate enough to have remained close friends with uh, others for over a duration of time it's because we are good friends to get love you give love to receive benefits from others you give so generosity is, is playing it forward and with friendships it's very valuable to nurture our friendships, all of our relationships. So if we develop new relationships, I find it no different than developing new relationships from being an early child to different friends I had in my teens to different friends I had in my 20s. Again, while we prefer to be able to be good friends and have good friends over time, New relationships are something that we're accustomed to. And I think that we become very complacent later on in life by not engaging new friends. Um, and it's something we have to work at. So I think endemically it's, it's part of our nature to seek out other people. And with the new technologies, if we multi-track here, Facebook has given us new options to connect with older friends and newer friends and build newer friends. So I don't think that family will be considered just biological in the, in the coming years as we live longer. We'll start seeing our extended family as being as valuable as our biological families and often um, equally, if not more, um, supportive. And uh, people will, in a sense, get new connections through their involvement with uh, chronic activities. And Garrett, maybe you can say something for people in the UK. If they are listening in the UK, uh, what options are there for connecting with like-minded uh, people oh. interested in chronics? Oh, how convenient that you asked that question. Um, the weekend after next, the... UK Cryonics Group are having a training weekend that you can come along for their own people, but anybody who's interested can go along and pay a visit and see what their setup is and all the arrangements and find out more. And it's in Sheffield. Where is that? In Sheffield. Sheffield. Um, the, I, we can put up a link to the UK Cryonics Group. Um, it's on the th weekend of the 14th and 15th, or is it the 13th, 14th? Anyway, it's a Saturday and Sunday, weekend after next. And what, what would typically happen at such a gathering? Um, basically, it's for them to practice, uh, for, for regular members to practice recovering someone. Um, so they practice doing CPR on a dummy, on a you know, on a special medical dummy, not just a shop window dummy, um, and putting someone in a nice bath and moving, you know, standby and rescue type things. The initial setup before someone is perfused. Um, which is what is, is here still done on a voluntary basis, um, so the, the volunteers are practicing. But there's a, it's a get-together as well, of course, being a weekend, you've got the Saturday night and people go out for a meal, and it's that's a good place to meet people to talk about all that kind of stuff. And build Plus, new start of friends. Soon? Sorry? Yeah, and build new friends, and of course build, people are well, welcome to really attend fun. the London yeah. Futurist event where there's uh, some like-minded uh, yes. like uh, friends as well. Absolutely, and and also you can bring your friends and family along with you into cryonics if you want to. And and shall I say my more cynical com comments that I typed there at the bottom, or do you think that would put me in a bad light? I will just say that I this is just a cynical comment about um, fr friends and fam loved ones. Is that at the end of the film Titanic, you didn't see Kate Winslet chuck herself in after Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio, did you? So, you know, you may have disasters in life, but that doesn't mean you want to give up yourself. But that is a cynical well, thing. And, you know, you can make friends and you can bring your family with you, and I would encourage you to because you're saving their lives, for heaven's sake. Okay, so that's nearly out of time. We have time, I think, for each of the panelists to pick any of the remaining questions and to give uh, quick answers that they think are appropriate. So I'll just uh, r briefly run through the questions and then we'll go through the panelists one by one and let you answer not necessarily all of the questions. Uh, Tom Ploem asks about, uh, well, in the future, isn't there going to be a singularity? People suggest that in 2045 there'll be a singularity and our bodies will merge with robots. Uh, 
wouldn't this make cryonic sort of irrelevant or where, where does cryonic stand on this path? We have a question from Jack Stringer who says he's 17 now, what's the best way to stand up, to stay up to date in cryonics and transhumanism in college and in the next 10 to 20 years of his life? We, to an extent we've just answered that by talking about uh, keeping it up to date with the online activities of London Futurists or and so on. Uh, we have uh, another question with two votes from Callum Chase. Uh, we'll just do the two two vote questions now. If it's not a rude question, why should someone consider Cryonics go to Alcor rather than the competition such as the Cryonics Institute in uh, America or Cryorus in uh, Russia or or some other place? So let's uh, have a pick and mix on some of these to round off the discussion. Uh, who would like to go first? I know which one I'm going to pick, but I don't have to go first. I'm going to pick the um, the one on the 2045. So just put me well, in whenever you, you want, but that's what I'm going to answer. Why don't you talk about, because that, that, that has quite a lot of interest. So yes, okay. So do you want me to start or do you yes, want please? Max? No, okay. let's, let's go. Um, Okay, so let's go. It says, there are people who suggest in 2045 there will be a singularity. Okay. Um, for first off, there will not be one big singularity. If it does occur, which we assume it will, computers are becoming smarter than humans, and that's the whole point of the singularity, that humans will need to upgrade themselves to keep ahead. Um, thus my extreme interest in human enhancement. So we don't have a date on it. Uh, Max Moore says it'll happen in surges. I tend to agree with that. I'm sure Anders would agree with that as well. I don't know where Gareth and David stand on it, but probably not one big fell swoop. So, um, okay, so our bodies will merge with robots. Our bodies are already merging with robots. I alluded to this earlier uh, in this uh, panel discussion about human enhancement and prosthetics and how it relates to cryonics, that if we're um, suspended, that we will probably need a new body Anyway, if we're a neuro suspendee or a whole body suspendee, we will probably need a new body. Thus, uh, my work is dealing with looking at a whole body prosthetic for radical life extension. The fact that robots could enhance with AI and become a nemesis for humanity, I think, is something that we can look at, but not something that is truly plausible, because in my view, we will become the AI or AGI. So I think we have to look at who we are, what's going on in the other areas, and how we're going to continue enhancing ourselves to protect our species and the evolution of our species. Thank you. Um, shall I jump in quickly? The, uh, this 2045 thing, I always thought the singularity was in 2030. When are they well, moving? It's been mildly postponed. Sorry? It's been mildly postponed. <laughs> No, oh. 2030 was FM 2030's date. Um, Ray Kurzweil never said 2030, and nor did Werner Vinci. It's just a hypothetical date, 2045. Well, I, um, but I, worry that, again, I worry that it keeps slipping back. But in the same way that I... It's going to keep slipping back, it's going to keep slipping back, and eventually it will come, but in the meantime, we need to take alternative uh, steps to look well, after ourselves, and we need alternative steps to uh, guard against uh, as uh, dying uh, too soon. Well, it would be marvellous, wouldn't it, if, if someone found, if Audrey, uh, Aubrey de Grey found the solution to ageing and we didn't need cryonics at all. I mean, or, you know, we have, uh, wouldn't that be fantastic? And we'd have always... It's still not going to work. We still need new bodies. We still and, don't want to be in a biological body. Exactly, you know, it's, it's, that would be lovely, but, I mean, it would be fantastic if that happens, but I'm cynical about that happening in my lifetime. Um, and can I answer the guy who's at 17 saying, what's the way to stay up to date? Well, obviously, there's all the web stuff you can stay up to date on. That's not a problem. In your early 20s, think about getting some life insurance. You don't have to make it out to any particular organization yet, but get it while you're young and healthy, while it's cheap. Um, get whole life insurance. Um, and who knows, we may have, it would be lovely if alcohol with enough people join, as per my previous plea, um, alcohol might be big enough to have several branches across the states and, uh, and have you know, storage facilities in different I think it has to be globalized. Um, this obviously is going to require a lot of money and a lot of members. Um, but uh, wouldn't it be marvelous if we had local storage facilities? I mean, by local, I mean in different countries or different states in, in the US. Um, obviously, that's a long way off. But it, no, it depends how many people sign up in the meantime. Uh, with no. scale, more things are possible. 
if we all uh, just hedge our bets and hang back, then there isn't the scale of momentum to make this transformation possible. Well, that, that's true. And, uh, when Max and I joined in um, 1986, I remember coming back and talking to other people in England at the time who were thinking about joining up. And one of them, and they started signing up because we had. And specifically, one of them said to me, I didn't think you'd ever do it, but now that you're doing it, I sort of got to do it. So if you're not sure about it, but you think you might, do go ahead and do it, and because it will bring other people along with you. Well, that was my experience. Yeah, Thanks. I, and just, just two, questions, oh, Max? two yeah. questions at once. Um, the, you know, the singularity question and the, the question of the person who's 17 kind of have a similar answer. We don't really know if there's going to be a singularity or when, um, but even if it is 2045 and it happens just as some people predict, that's 32 years away. That's a long time. A lot can go wrong in that time. Um, I suggest that you have your backup option in place. You may think you're going to be okay for that period of time, but you don't know. We, we had to cry because of a 23-year-old woman earlier this year who had serious brain cancer. Anything can happen at any time. Um, when you're young, you know, Garrett said, get life insurance even if you don't sign up with an organization. I would add a little bit to that. Become an associate member. Uh, that's ten dollars a month. It doesn't get you Cryo Preserve, but it does get you the magazine, a bunch of other things you can see on the website. And very importantly, it gives us informed consent. It shows that you have an interest, and um, it makes it easier than if something happens in an emergency. If you have life insurance ready, we could then move ahead and probably get you signed up very, very quickly. Whereas if you have no record of your interest, we run into problems of uh, informed consent and resistance from the family. So please, at least consider becoming an associate member um, and get life insurance while you're young and insurable, because you may not be insurable 10, 20 years from now. That happens to a lot of people. Uh, so that's really very important to do. And what about the question from Callum Chase about a uh, uh, why would people pick one Cryonix organization rather than another? And obviously you're a bit biased to answer this, but maybe you can follow your previous habit of being quite uh, balanced and <coughs> level-minded level in your answer. Well, the most important thing is to make cryopreservation arrangements uh, with somebody. Um, I wouldn't actually recommend CryoRus unless you live in Moscow, simply because uh, well, they don't have a lot of track record. They don't have a patient care trust fund. It seems that they're hoping to keep people cryopreserved by paying for it with new customers, which I don't think is a very sustainable model. Uh, Chronix Institute's been around a long time. Uh, they cost less than Alcor. Uh, they have less sophisticated procedures, I would argue. Uh, we have, I think, better cryoprotectants. Uh, the cost of cryopreservation with Alcor includes standby stabilization and transport, whereas with CI you have to make <coughs> separate arrangements for that, and it'll actually end up costing more if you're happy to be a neuro patient with Alcor. Um, generally, CI is relying on the future to fix more damage, whereas Alcor's approach is really to minimize the damage we do now, because not only do we not know what future repair capabilities we have, we don't know what kind of condition you'll be in to start with. So we need to minimize any extra damage we do in the process, especially any delays uh, until we begin the procedure. That's why I think standby is a critical part of it. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is sign up with somebody, or at least to get that life insurance in place now, because you may not better get it later on. Anders, any final thoughts from you? Well, I'd like to combine the question of Eric Driscoll with the question from Charles Ware. I don't think opposition to cryonics comes from a primarily religious source. Rather, people have various biases and views which we then express using a religious symbolism if they happen to be religious. Otherwise, we will invent some other rationalization. So we need to kind of work hard on getting through these biases. And I think cryonics is actually not at all about copping out and leaving the, in the future to solve all our problems. It's actually taking the future seriously. We want to be in it. We want uh, to make sure the future is a good place where we might want to enjoy living. Which means that even before we're suspended, we might have to work very hard on making sure we go in the right direction. Well, thanks very much for that, Anders. I think we are out of time. What I would like to do at the very end of this event is just a briefly recap on a couple of things that's going to be happening next. Uh, we've had today this uh, uh, panel with uh, the future of chronics. We have another number of uh, hangouts lined up. One of the hangouts that's lined up is in the beginning of January. It's when we look at some related questions uh, as covered by the 
very interesting author, Rames Nam, who has written a number of books, uh, some of which are fiction, some of which are non-fiction, and uh, he addresses enhancements that could happen in the near future in terms of understanding how minds work and how minds cooperate. So uh, I suggest uh, you might find more details about that. Uh, sorry, I'm just fiddling with my slides here, trying to get the right slide back. We have a number of panelists on that, including Randall Kuhn, who is the chief scientist for the 2045 uh, initiative, Michelle Zappa, who is a futurologist based in uh, Brazil, and Julio Prisco, who is based in uh, Hungary. And uh, all four of them have got fascinating things to say on that topic. Looking slightly further afield, I would like to briefly mention one more event, which is actually an in real life event in uh, Birkbeck College in uh, London, which will be happening on March the 20th and sorry, March the 22nd and 23rd, in which we've got uh, 18 speakers from around the world speaking on a range of topics, all with the big theme anticipating 2025. What might be the visions for uh, how to? get to 2025 successfully, bearing in mind all the potential issues in the society uh, b between now and then, what are the visions, what are the roadmaps and what are the plans to get there, and also looking at the philosophical uh, dimension to this too through transhumanism. So uh, actually a couple of the panelists from today, that's Natasha and Anders will both be amongst the speakers and you'll find more details of the speakers on the Anticipating 2025 website. So having said all that, I'd just like to finally give a big uh, thanks to all my panelists for bringing uh, their expertise to bear on this topic. I would uh, anticipate that uh, we might revisit this question shortly. I think that uh, the advent of technology, uh, the improvements that are likely to take place in uh, understanding the brain and understanding uh, different aspects of the human biology are such that there's probably going to be big changes in this field uh, sooner than we think. But who knows? We've had optimism in the past and that's taken a while. So thanks to everybody for taking part and thanks to everybody for their questions. Please keep an eye on londonfuturist.com for news on future events. Thanks.